Hi, I'm Dr. Sandra Barrett, a scientist, photographer, and author. I've been invited here by my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Liz Tosh, to introduce you to a new way of looking at wine, to explore the inner beauty and structure and have uh, moments of discovery for yourself. So I invite you to have some fun with seeing the shapes and taste of wine. This first slide, we see different shapes through the microscope. A couple of them are wine and one is a chemical of taste. And through this exploration, you will discover which is which and learn perhaps how to use them for yourself. This image changed my life. I had no intention of ever getting into the world of wine. I'd been invited to interview for uh, artist in residence program up at Sterling Vineyards. And I thought I should photograph a wine through the microscope. And when I showed it to the winemaker, he said, it looks like it tasted. How can a picture look like a taste? This was in the early 1980s, probably before some of you were born. And uh, I had two years to prepare the show with the winemaker asking all kinds of questions like, what did Merlot look like? Did different varietals look different? What about wine from different vineyards? He would ask questions and I would bring my microscope up to Sterling. And it was a very joyful experience looking inside wine. However, I had no intention of ever becoming a wine whisperer, if you will. I, I'm a medical scientist. At the time of my beginning work at, at, with Sterling, I was at the University of California Medical School, and my work was to research how did human white blood cells work? How do they mature? What can we learn about them in order to be able to diagnose human leukemias in much more objective ways. A leukemia is a cancer of the white blood cell and there are probably 15 different kinds of leukemias and they're not easy to diagnose. So that was the work I was embarking on for many, many years. Here's an example of uh, some human leukemia cells and what was very obvious to me um, after having experience of looking at uh, normal cells was the abnormal shapes, the chaotic differentiation and maturation of these cells. I began to leap in my mind that cells that look chaotic create chaos in the body, a little bit of form following function. Many of, mo many of my research studies were with children with leukemia and one dad came up to my lab asking me to photograph his son's leukemia cells. This was way in the early days before imagery was recognized as being something useful in medicine. And I soon started bringing slideshows, the old kind of slideshows, to pediatric oncology clinic for children to see what normal blood cells look like, what, nor what abnormal cells look like, and an accident, if you will, that took me to the Science Museum in the Golden Gate Park showed me that the microscope I was using to photograph cells could be used to photograph molecules. And, I, and the exhibit there was of chemicals of the brain which were incredibly beautiful. I had no idea, even though I'm a biochemist, I had no idea that chemicals had any reality or anything other than stick, stick figures in textbooks. So I began photographing the chemicals of life to share with children some of the beauty that was inside. This first picture is vitamin B12. It's made up of pentagons, if you will, and the color comes from cobalt, which is the mineral held in the center of the molecule. The same shape molecule is used to make hemoglobin and chlorophyll, another program. So first I was giving them vitamins and minerals actually to look at. This last, this image is calcium phosphate. It's what makes bone. It actually looks like bone in my mind. 
Then we get into other minerals. This is a mineral silica, silicon dioxide, that helps in the growth of bone. It also helps in the growth of plants, especially making the stem flexible and strong. This is another mineral, sodium phosphate. Just notice the different shapes of these molecules that are essential for life. This is a, a molecule, sodium phosphate, that balances acid in the body, balances bases, and you could see it created a balancing figure. And one last uh, vitamin, this is niacin. I was always leaping forward in my mind thinking, oh well, where do we get niacin? We see it in grain. It looks like this is coming from grain, wheat. And so, once again, I started leaping into the shape of molecules was telling us something about form and function, which is a, ver which is a fairly common theory in biology and chemistry. Things look like what they do. I moved more into molecules that influence the human body besides vitamins and minerals. This is adrenaline through the microscope. Adrenaline is what we make when we're excited or what the stress uh, fight, or fight or flight response. And there's certain receptors on our cells, which we'll show you later, on how our cells respond to these molecules. So the shape of molecules is essential to how we work at a molecular level. Now, how do molecules shape our taste, since shape is essential in function? I'm going to show you three different shapes of molecules, and I'm going to ask you to reflect on which you think is sweet, sour, and bitter. So we see now three different molecules. One is sweet, one is sour, and one is bitter. And since I can't ask you to raise your hands and tell me which you, which you guess, um, the molecule on the upper left is, uh, the angular molecule is sour. And I would guess, most of you guessed, in fact, that the bottom prickly looking molecule was bitter, which is caffeine. And the one on the right is sugar. And you'll learn a little bit more about. So our molecules, of our tastes have different shapes. And this, what I'm asking you, inviting you to do is to be able to launch into or appreciate your own ex instinctual intelligence, that we know things that our intellect may tell us we have no right to know. So instinctual intelligence, the studies done in the 1920s showed that if you gave people these two abstract shapes and asked them, what name would you give them, Takati or Maluma? And again, I'll ask you, which A is Takati or is it Maluma? Most of you will guess, in fact, it's universal that all of everybody says A is Takati. And this is work that re was reported in Carol Yoon's book, A UCLA Scientist, Naming Nature, that regardless of our age, regardless of the language we spoke, that angular image was called Takati, and the round blobby image was Maluma. And I'm proposing to you that the shapes of the molecules that you will see and learn about influence the language we use to describe wine and describe taste. After all, I have, I have no words for wine. So way back when getting into wine, the first grape I was studied with uh, Theo Rosenbrand, the winemaker at Sterling, was Merlot and got into the vat, got into everything, got it up into the vineyards. And an interesting observation early on was Grape juice from any of the grapes is tiny and geometric. I have to magnify it much more than the molecules you've seen, but tiny and geometric. And one clear message from the molecules was juice is tiny, and what we see is a grape grows up. So how we understand wine is usually 
uh, wine ages, can, most wines can age for a little while, and they change how they look, they may soften, they may become more complex, and that's exactly what we see. So here's Merlot at one year. Uh, the uh, forms are much larger and more complex, and here's Merlot, all these from Sterling, at four years old, much larger, softer, more drinkable wine. So a wine grows up, a grape grows up, and we can see that as well as taste it. An obvious question was, well, are all juices from vinifera grapes tiny and geometric? Here we have a Merlot, yes. Here we have Cabernet Sauvignon, yes. Here we have Pinot Noir, and now we have a Chardonnay. So all grape juices uh, when they're freshly squeezed out of the grape are tiny geometric forms and they're very simple. This is an example of fermentation, what happens at the next stage after we've pressed the grape juice. The forms that look like sort of diamonds are most likely tartrates and in the background you see these tiny, tiny round creatures which are yeast. This was a Chardonnay fermentation with a cultured yeast. Just to give you an example of what transformation begins to look like. We see more light because of the alcohol being formed. When I started doing this photography, not being a wine scientist at all, people were always saying, oh, all you're photographing are the tartrates, the tartaric acid. You know, the crystals on the cork on a white wine. So I, of course I had to go and photograph what does tartaric acid look like and learned a little bit, learned a lot about um, that this is an acid that's only found in grapes, which gives grape a unique molecular disposition, if you will. One question I'm off, often asked is, where do the colors come from? If I'm photographing through a light microscope, there's the image on the left shows what it looks like, what, tart, what the tartrates would look like with no polarizer. The microscope I use has polarizing prisms. And on the right side, you see what the difference you see with the, the colors come through the, basically me dialing the prisms. And I can see what color I was shining on to the crystals and then the material itself refracts the light. The advantage of using a polarizer with your microscope, because anybody could go to their lab and do this, is that one, you get more definition of what you see, and two, you also get a more three-dimensional expression, as well as a textural. I can get a sense of the texture of what uh, I'm seeing under the microscope. So we're going to leap into a little more science of the five chemical tastes. We might think our tastes are not important to us other than giving us pleasure, but I see them as their gatekeepers for survival. This, and these molecules and these forms of taste are giving our cells information. So the sweet taste is telling us that what we have just tasted is an energy source. The salty taste tells us it's a mineral source, probably from the sea. The savory or umami taste tells us this is a nitrogen source, all of these essential for our life. So these three tastes are essential to life. The sour taste, on the other hand, tells us this comes from fruit that's not ripe yet, or it's fermented, or it's spoiled. And then the bitter taste, like that prickly caffeine, warns of danger, of anything that's potentially toxic, to not take in too much of a bitter substance. So into a little more detail of the shape of taste. Here's sour. And what we see with sour, this is sour malic acid from unripe grapes, unripe apples. Uh, this is citric acid from lemons, limes, and we see that all acids are sour, all acids taste sharp, 
and their forms are angular and sharp. The taste comes from hydrogen ions, electrically charged ions. Now we have another angular molecule of taste, salt, salty. This is sea salt, it's sodium chloride, and its taste comes from sodium ions, electrically charged. And that becomes important if you want to understand how our cells take in these tastes. But what's interesting in terms of wine, if we taste a wine that's too tannic or bitter that we don't like, if we put a little salt or, or a little squeeze of lemon on our food, all of a sudden the wine, the taste of wine changes. We know that salt is an enhancer of taste, but it also helps suppress bitter and strengthens the aroma of a wine. So we have these wonderful tastes that help us improve our experience of wine. This is uh, sucrose, it's sweet. It's made up of two molecules called glucose and fructose, and it's rounded, and you can see it's also, the glucose looks sticky. It enhances our perception of what's fruity and what's also tart and spicy. Umami, savory. It comes from nitrogen-containing compounds like amino acids or proteins. Uh, the person who brought this to the Western knowledge was Tim Hanai, who's often called the Swami of Umami. Uh, in the development of our tastes, originally we had in the West only four tastes, sweet, sour, bitter, and, and salty. But the Japanese around the turn of last century said, we eat foods that have a different quality taste. We eat seafood, we eat um, seaweed, and they were able to isolate MSG, monosodium glutamate, a nitrogen-containing compound, which is one of the features of the taste of umami. In fact, this photograph is umami, received from Ajinomoto. MSG has gotten a lot of bad rap, but essentially it's been used to enhance the flavor, a meaty flavor of a broth. You can taste a little bit, you don't need a lot. Our bodies, by the way, do make MSG. And if you see that this molecule is round, it rounds out our taste. In case you are unfamiliar with what would be savory umami foods, cheese, mushrooms, soy sauce, seaweed, tomatoes, all of these foods for the most part will influence or improve your experience, at least of red wine. Don't we see often serve cheese and crackers with wine? Now we know why. Bitter, bitter prickly. The kinds of compounds that give us bitter experiences are drugs, phytonutrients, alkaloids, poisons, and this is not a poison, this is our morning wake up, at least my morning wake up, caffeine through the microscope. Of all these five tastes, so far we have five, there's a sixth suggested of fat. Only two of them are considered universally pleasurable tastes, sweet and savory, and you can see they're both fairly rounded molecules. Then we get into caffeine or the prickly, bitter tastes. How our cells respond to these, they're receptors on the surface of our taste bud cells, and they will be able to distinguish the different shapes of those uh, molecules. On the other hand, s salty and sour don't have receptors to get in the cell. They can penetrate the surface of the cell because of their electrical charge. At least that's what we think. So now, let's see what's in your glass. Here's an example of a couple of different Chardonnay styles. The one on the left is a lean, austere Chardonnay, and the other two are full-bodied, buttery Chardonnays. My favorite is a buttery, full mouth feel, 
Chardonnay and what influences the difference, one of the differences in the style of Chardonnay is whether or not the winemaker has used what's called secondary fermentation or malolactic fermentation. So here we have malolactic fermentation changes the acids in wine. If we're going through malolactic, the molecule on the right is the big molecule, big tart malic acid, which changes then to the smaller, buttery, uh, milky, if you will, lactic acid. So that's one way that we can change the expression of a wine. And we can see it here through the microscope. I took this quote from Karen McNeil because usually what we're doing in using words to describe wine, we're using words that are something we can relate to or we're familiar with. So she says, where Chardonnay is all buttery roundness, Sauvignon Blanc is taut lithe with a keen stiletto of acidity. If Chardonnay is Marilyn Monroe, Sauvignon Blanc is Jamie Lee Curtis. And they're definitely different styles in our mouth and visually. This is a quote I like to use because people are asking me, what are you photographing? Tell me what this is. Tell me the name of the molecule. Well, the quote is broader than that. Molecular photography captures a world invisible to the naked eye. It opens the mysteries to molecules and cells. It is art based on reality, not an artist's imagined repre representation. Images tell a story or act as a portrait. They may even communicate scientific, scientific information visually so it's more easily understood. Then it becomes a teaching tool. This is from John Naisbitt's book, High Tech, High Tech, and Our Search for Meaning. So I've looked at these images as being ways of teaching about how we can appreciate wine as well as understanding how our body works. They're more expressive than just the words, at least for me. This is the Sauvignon Blanc. It was a winemaker, Sterling winemaker's one of his favorite wines, my least favorite wine. And people have always asked, do different varietals have different expressions? Well, for the most part, Sauvignon Blanc often has a similar, similar kinds of expression. That was a Sterling Sauvignon Blanc. This was a Patiana Sauvignon Blanc. This is a Benziger Sauvignon Blanc. These two uh, Sauvignon Blancs were from the same vineyard, different wineries, also biodynamic. I'm sorry, there were beautiful, crisp, lean wines, not something my palate enjoys. So I began thinking, maybe this is why I don't like Sauvignon Blanc. I don't like that lean, austere expression. Aha! But then I discovered uh, doing a project with Hourglass, here was a Sauvignon Blanc I really liked. It was soft, and what softened it was they used oak, some oak thyme in the fermentation of the Sauvignon Blanc, giving it a totally different expression. So this gives you an opportunity to imagine what wines you might like and how you might uh, find better ways to like it. And I'm also asking you in this exploration to change how you see things. Everything can't be our words. This is an old quote from Marcel Proust who said, the real voyage of discovery consists in not in seeking new lands, but seeing with new eyes. So I'm asking you to see life and wine with new eyes. And what's in our glass to drink? Often in a, a presentation, we will guess the shape of the wine we're drinking. Here we don't have that option, but you can do that at home. Next time you pour a glass of wine, what do you think it looks like? What's its expression? Is it going to be a legendary wine? Is it one we're going to remember? This is a legendary wine, Chateau Lafitte Rothschild, and I see these shapes as giving structure, backbone to the wine. This wine had some structure and a lot of soft forms. It was a Robert Mondavi Reserve Cab from 1979. 
Many wines will show me one form. Some wines will show me many forms. More complexity. This was a Viator three-year-old uh, Cabernet Sauvignon blend. And this is a, I recently photographed, this is Tim Mondavi's 2013 Continuum. And I, there are hints in this image that the wine can age for a long time. So one of the questions comes up with, what do we see with age? How does wine change? And there's one thing seeing how a grape grows up, but what about looking at the same wine? So here's a 2002 Rudd Oakville, Cabernet, Oakville Estate Cabernet Sauvignon. On the left is three years. I had the, another bottle of the wine. Fortunately, Leslie Rudd shared another bottle. And on the right, three, a half year later, the wine softened, opened up. On the left, I would say that was a very focused, concentrated wine. It was elegant, um, but it became softer and also expressing ageability features. Here's another example of Alpha Omega, a proprietor, proprietor's red, which is a Cabernet blend. On the left, you see three-year-old wine. On the right is the wine a year later, and you can see the sort of prickly, angular arrow forms all softened up in another year. I'd really like to do this one now, 10 years later. And it doesn't just go changes of shape uh, with age in cabs. Here's an example of a Pinot Noir from Jericho at three years and four years, getting larger and more complex. It's pretty amazing that, to really be able to see it as well as taste it. In the old days, in the old days of Engl the original Inglenook, I had been hired to photograph 44 years of Inglenook cast cabs. They had planned a whole event for the wine spectator, and the wine spectator put the wrong date on their calendar. So though they had a whole dinner planned with all these famous wine people sitting around the room waiting for the wines and the food, they asked me to join them since we weren't having the wine spectator. So I not only got to taste the wine, I got to photograph it. And they seated me next to Andre Chelichev, who I wish I had known to take notes how he was describing these wines. So here was a 1985, uh, it was probably, a, well, it was a cast cab. We don't know what the blend was. Two years old, sharp. Here we have a 17-year-old uh, Cabernet. Cass Cabernet, and here we have the 44-year-old 1941 Inglenook. And this wine was the first American wine to ever win 100 points with Wine Spectator. And a wine writer I met when I started doing this work again in 2000 told me he had actually tasted this wine again around 2004, and it still was quite livable and vital. However, there are wines that begin to fall apart. They don't live 44 years. We have probably not that many wines made in California that live 44 years now. This is an example of what a wine looks like as it begins to lose its vitality. You can see it no longer can refract light. This was an old Pinot Noir, and this was an old Sauvignon Blanc. So there's another quality that we can see around aging uh, the ability to refract light changes. It looks like a fallen leaf. This is really an old, old vine Zinfandel up in Dry Creek Valley. I think this is actually Lytton Springs, 100-year-old vines. And 100-year-old vines often can make wonderful wine, even though the wine might not be 100 years old. Here we have an example of Two wines made from Dry Creek, at Dry Creek Valley, two Zinfandels, same year. On the left is Mazzocco, on the right is Perkins Harder. And I was surprised how similar in form these two wines were. I know Perkins wine was from 100-year-old vines. I couldn't find out if the one, if Mazzocco was, but they were from the same AVA. When winemakers look at 
which vineyard do they use? They're looking at their experience of the vineyard and the taste of the grape. Here we can see an example of different vineyards providing different qualities to the wine. This was a project I did with Hourglass looking at 2012 Cabernet Sauvignon. This was three, also everything seemed to be three year old. On the left was the cab made from the Hourglass vineyard and they have another vineyard called Blue Line. And you can see there was a lot more structure or backbone from that vineyard. And I believe we can learn a lot about how to blend our wines if we use a little bit of photography. How we grow our wines, many winemakers say we're wine growing, we're not wine making. How we grow the vineyards influences also what, what we'll see, not just the backbone. The first heart I ever saw in wine came from this 2001 Quintessa, also from Napa Valley, also a Bordeaux blend. And what I learned after the fact of why, why a heart? Um, this is a biodynamic wine, which in my mind says that these wine, wine growers are taking very good care of their vineyards. They're organic, they're um, biodiverse, uh, and there's a spiritual inclination in biodynamics. And this was another biodynamic wine from uh, Bordeaux, uh, Chateau Le Mandot uh, also showed a heart, and I often see hearts in red biodynamic wines. This, was a, this heart uh, comes from a Sky Saddle Sangiovese. So I asked the question, if wine had a picture that reflected its expression, would that help us know the wine? Would that help us know what we like better? We have words for wine that for some of us don't make sense. On the, the big fluttery mole, molecule on the right is, would be called a feminine form. So we do have people say, oh, this is a feminine wine and this is a masculine wine. The feminine wine is an opus one and the masculine here, the sharp pointy uh, molecule shows, that's from a, a BV Cabernet. Our molecules, will they, the expression be tight and focused? Will they be crisp? Will they be rounded? Are they full mouthed experiences? Where, where do our words come from that we name wine? Pat Simon, so I'm not the first one who ever looked at wine shapes. Pat Simon had, was a, one of the first masters of wine. He's a British wine merchant, wine expert, a consultant to the World Bank on wine. And he talked about how he experienced wine. He would see images and he would see the images change uh, in his mind as the wine changed. And some of his shapes are very similar to what we see through the microscope. I'm often asked, what am I seeing? What are these molecules? And my answer is usually the beauty of wine. It also is an answer that is unsatisfactory for scientists because they want me to name what these are. And what I really believe about the photography, I'm capturing the way the molecules come together in the elixir of wine, the congregations of molecules, if you will. Another example of the shape of, mo the shape of molecules influencing our experience of taste and flavor, these are different shapes of receptors Remember, molecules land on receptors if they can be recognized. And you can see all these different smells have different shaped receptors, again, uh, influencing how the body responds. I put together this slide uh, last night, theories of language of, of taste to see if I can give you a little more um, meat, if you will, beside, in addition to the pretty pictures. Our sensory input through smell, through taste, 
is all through, it's multidimensional. It's multiple receptors have to respond to those molecules. So it's like we're, re we're creating an image in our brain of these cells, cells and molecular responses. In some theories, the sense of smell is linked evolutionary to, evolutionarily to language and to memory. And we know that one of the first things that goes um, when we're losing our memory uh, in Alzheimer's or something is a sense of smell. Another example of where smell plays a part and the molecule plays a part multidimensionally is that it's not just the shape of the molecule, it's the vibration of the molecule that influences the response. So, so I will propose to you that our molecules pro pro provide information because of their shape, because of them their being recognized. Our cells uh, are pattern recognizing individuals. And our images that we might imagine for, oh, this wine tastes like, it looks like, is another way for us to know and remember wine. It takes us into our trusting our intuition and our imagination, if you will. So here's two different images. You might want to guess how would that wine taste. Another quote, since I'm always struggling for words with wine, this comes from Jamie Good in The Science of Wine. What we're doing with our tasting notes is using a code language that gives information about a number of aspects of the wine. We should take ourselves a little less seriously when we're attempting the difficult job of describing wine in words. And I have leaped one more time saying, Maybe what we're discovering through the microscope are wine glyphs or a wine code that will help us understand wine more deeply or at least to have more fun with it. So I'm inviting you to imagine wines in the future. What might the bottle look like? We may have a bottle labeled with a masculine form or a focused form or rounded form. What's in our glass? what's coming out in the flavors of the wine. Will we have all these little glyphs on wine bottles to tell, to inform us, this is the one you're gonna like best. So I'm inviting you to take that project on and to be able to dance with wine and have a good time with wine. And I've had such a wonderful time with wine. A few years ago, I decided to write a book called Wine's Hidden Beauty that covers a fair bit of what I've covered in this presentation. And I thank you very much for being part of this journey into the exploration of wine, having new eyes. And I invite you to open your awareness and imagination to when you drink wine, what does it look like? Thank you very much.